Good morning, good morning all. This is uh, George, George Hallmay, and uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of ground on um, looking at the fundamental factors that uh, affect our Forex trading. Good to see so many of you uh, in this morning, and uh, of course, fairly uh, momentous times that we're in at the moment with the euro, which looks as if it's collapsing, with the... Um, We've also got the uh, dollar index that is now, right now as we speak, skirting with, with new highs. And of course it remains to be seen whether, whether, and it's a sort of a big weather or a big if, we're going to see uh, any uh, any big, big breakthrough today. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the charts uh, a little bit later on, but uh, what I'm really most interested in right now is uh, just considering some of those factors that do actually drive the markets besides the technical. By linking the two together, um, I trade off technicals primarily, but I do like to keep an eye on what's going on uh, on the fundamental aspects. And of course, we're beset with every single day. We uh, we, we receive so many uh, so many little news announcements. Some of them really quite minor, might have a little blip in the market. Um, others are the real big ones which uh, are likely to move the market and they are the highly anticipated events. And of course this week we've got one of those with the uh, non-farm payrolls on Friday. And that is really one of the big ones. So let's just, just look at some of these considerations first of all. Now the, the very first thing that um, we sort of really want to be aware of is a um, very simple fact that the Forex market is... Um, it's got a fixation, and that fixation is interest rates. But not what sort of where interest rates are today, but where they're likely to be moving into the future. So if there's likely to be an announcement and uh, it relates to interest rates, then yes, it is likely to have an effect on the market. It can move the market. And of course, pretty well all a news, news announcement can be related back to what's going on with the interest rates. And of course, we get uh, statements coming up. Um, hi, guys. Uh, good to see you in there, Boyke. And uh, we get these hawkish and dovish statements. Hawkish, you know, sort of being bullish. Dovish being um, uh, probably a little bit sort of uh, bearish or, or suggesting that maybe interest rates um, are, are not going to rise. So you get these statements that come out of central bankers. They come out of the Fed and so on. Then we get them, all the numbers coming out. There are just so many of these. Trade balance. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, the, the Producer Price Index, which of course raw materials, which you know raw material prices go up, that's likely to be reflected back in the CPI um, in a period of time. GDP, we're, we're hearing an awful lot about GDP at the moment, the debt levels being you know, percentages of GDP and so on. Gross domestic product, so uh, you know more or less if you just add together pretty well the entire output of, of country you're, you're getting GDP. GNP, well, uh, countries like the States where an awful lot of their activity actually goes on outside of their own shores, then, uh, you know, they link that together as well. So G GNP is a much, much bigger number. Payroll numbers, of course, you know, once again mentioned that on Friday we're going to get the big one. Retail sales, housing start, and so on. There are just so many of these. There are just so many of them which, uh, which can have an effect. So now, on a on a daily basis, on a daily basis, these announcements um, tend to come out. Uh, U.S. economic data um, it, it, they come out of uh, the state eight thirty, typically Eastern Standard Time, um, one thirty BST, twelve thirty GMT, and so that's uh, that, that's a really interesting time. And of course, that's that's where uh, the U.S. when the U.S. Starting to sort of wake up around about um, um, 8.20, not around about, exactly 8.20, the bond market opens, and the bond market second biggest market, uh, next uh, next in line to Forex, and of course, you know, that's the credit market, that's, uh, that, that's the interest rate market of the world, that opens uh, just before those announcements come out. And then of course, as mentioned, Fed chairman, you know, there are a whole series of Fed chairmen, various uh, Fed um regions throughout the states and it just needs one of them to sort of come up with a little comment or indeed um you know one wonders if they're perhaps primed every now and again to pop a little announcement in just to, just to, just feed it into the market so that uh, 
we, 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 we might be sort of softened up to something that's about to come. And then, of course, um, the, the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee in, in the States, they churn out the minutes um, once a month of their uh, of, of how they've arrived at whatever rate decision they've come up with that particular month. By the way, if you, if you want a real good, well, a tedious read, something that will send you to sleep at night, get hold of the minutes, read through them, and, um, you know, it's, it can be really quite interesting. You know, it, it's, I, I used to read them now and again, but a um, bit of a bore, actually, now, to be quite honest. But there we are. And, of course, you know, non-farm payroll, always the first Friday in the month. And, of course, it's this week. Manufacturing data, retail sales data, consumer confidence indexes, of which there are several. U.S. then is the most important. It's the one that, of course, it's the uh, <laughs> it, it's the it, it's the thing that sort of wags the whole world. The rest of us, we're just little tails on the end. So, um, but of course, increasingly, we're we're finding that announcements coming out of the uh, the European Central Bank, the the EU, news tends to come out various different times of, of day, but typically around about 11 o'clock in the morning, we're getting announcements. But of course. The individual states that make up the um, the, uh, the the euro, or I should say the uh, the European Monetary Union, they will come out at sort of uh, various other times. So you want to look at a good uh, a good calendar, which is going to tell you when these are going to be coming out. And of course, you know, depending upon how important they are. And recently, we've been hanging on pretty well every word coming out of the ECB. Then uh, that that's that, that's really important. Bank of England, we have a um, little announcement coming out this morning at 9.30, and, uh, you know, that again is a typical time when uh, we're going to get those things. And, and, of course, cable is, pound against the dollar, that is, is going to move, is likely to move, and it's likely to move um, based on whatever those numbers uh, turn out to be. And then, of course, what have we got? We've got the, uh, the Australasians, we've got Japan, Bank of Japan, we get announcements coming out from around about midnight, um, uh, coming out of Australia, similar sort of time. Midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, for those people who, uh, in, in whatever time zone you happen to be, there's going to be an announcement that um, is going to have an effect upon your trading. So there we are. Um, and the bottom line there is Forex market fixated, fixated. It's, um, it, it's, it's a manic depressive is the Forex market. It goes manic in one direction and then depressive in the other. So, a um, bit of psychology in there. You know, those people who know a bit about uh, manic depressives, I suppose we all have a little bit of that now and again. Some of us more than others. But that's exactly what the Forex market is. It's a manic depressive and it's fixated on interest rate changes and, of course, any data that's likely to uh, impact upon it. Right, so let's just look at a news page. Let's just look at a news page. This is, this is a chart now. This is a, a, a non-farm payroll day. It's cable, pound against the dollar, one minute chart. Got our, uh, got our unique, um, patented, uh, color charts on here. So we want to be short when it's red. We want to be, uh, long when it's blue. And I'll swing chase down below here. But what I really want to focus on is what is actually happening just up, and as you can see, this is 1.30, uh, British summer time. And um, this would be 12:30 GM cheerful. And then what we've actually found is that on this this one, it just just prior to 1:30 down, 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 it, 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 it's sort of coming. But it's been, it's been uncertain there for uh, about some 10 minutes or so past the number. Anyway, the number hits the news wire, wallop, wallop. And of course, you know there are those people who will put a trade on, and just about where that question mark is. You know, allowing a little bit of latency on the on the internet or the VPN or whatever it is that you use to connect through to your uh, your, your broker. Uh, heaven forbid, forbid you're picking up the telephone trying to do it by the phone. By the time you actually click the button and you get filled, well, price is going to be down here somewhere in this red candle. And um, you know, you just might be the unluckiest trader out there and get filled right at the bottom. There. Get filled right at the bottom. And then what happens, the, the market then bounces back. Now, poor old Joe Soap, who, who went short, he's, he's sort of short down there, probably about ooh, 150.06 or 150.05, something like that. He's got to find this market is now going, whoo, dear, 35-odd pips um, against a trader. 
and um, sees it's going back all the way back up into the original trading zone. And then what does poor old Joe Soap do? Oh, no, I take the last, got to get out of it, got it all wrong. Only to find the market then moves down in the direction that it started to move in the first place. And, um, well, let's just follow the woes of this poor old trader all the way on through. It then hits a new low, and of course there are those traders out here who will buy new highs, sell lows, and the trader then thinks, all oh, right, okay, this is it, I'm now going to go short, I'm, I'm, I'm with the market. And temporarily, temporarily, you know, you might just sort of see 10 pips of paper profit, only to find that here we go on up, of course, you know, there are those traders who are going to trade the Brahmi break, and away they go, and up it goes. Poor old Joe Soap by this time is so demoralised, he's lost so much money in his account, that he's probably turned it in and switched everything off and decided he's going to go off and become a milkman or, or get, a, get, a, get a job in a supermarket somewhere. Right, so there we go. You know, there are various opportunities to be had. Now, one thing I do just want to, um, great stuff, Bola, I just want to mention here is that why is this likely to happen? Why shouldn't we just get a nice, clean move? You know, if the news is intense enough, if it's strong enough, uh, things like non-farm payroll showing that um, just just maybe the number is sufficiently large that the market really should just be going in one direction. Well, one of the big problems with non-farm payroll is that exactly the self same time as non-farm employment change comes out, there is also published the unemployment rate. Now, you would have thought that the two numbers will be moving in exactly the self same direction, but sometimes they conflict. So you get a strong non-farm employment change. The unemployment rate, which is calculated somewhat differently, is going to be uh, somewhat different. So one will conflict the other. And then there's even a third set of numbers that come out, um, not quite so important, but the average hourly earnings. So you can understand here that the headline triggers the non-farm payroll, so that you know, may well suggest that in this case it's not good for um, good good for the U.S. dollar. Uh, sorry, it's good for the U.S. dollar, so cable collapses. But then you find there's a conflict with the unemployment rate, and other traders are going to be thinking, "Hey ho, you know, we've just got to jump on this the other side now because the unemployment rate is actually suggesting it's bullish for the U.S. dollar." And then you know there'll be another group of traders saying, "Oh well, no, 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 that's just balance one of all of this is happening in the blink of several eyes, and uh, that's why the non-farm payroll is one that can be the most difficult one to attempt to trade on the news. I never do. I never do. My good friend Ed Ponzi um, <laughs> always talks about non-farm payroll. Good day to go and play golf. Good play to, day to go and play golf. So there we go. Non-farm payrolls. One that, uh, you know, I have in my murky past traded, but um, overall, overall, whilst I have had some phenomenal winners, I've had some phenomenal losers. And uh, overall, I've uh, I've not effectively made money out of trading on farm payroll. Right, Paul, here, yeah, yeah, um, simple reason, very simple. Um, a, a filled-in candle, okay, is a down candle, meaning that it, it opened at the high there, all right, and that candle closed at the low. Now then, the next candle opened at the low and closed up the high, and that's an, an open candle, okay? So of the same color, and it's purely the individual candle itself, not in relation to the previous candle, it's that individual candle itself. If it opened lower and closed higher, then it's hollow. You know, we can look at this over here on, uh, on the blue ones there, okay? Opened lower, closed high, higher, that's that engulfing. And of course, the preceding candle is a down candle. It opened at the high part of it and closed at the low. And of course, you know, we've got the, uh, we've got the shadows either side of it or the wicks or the tails as I prefer to call it. <coughs> right, let's move on. Now, we just follow this little bit of trading along here. So we get the mayhem around about 1.30, 2 o'clock it starts to settle down. And then of course, price is waving up, waving down, you know, where is it going? Where well, it doesn't really quite know. And then what do we do? We get a nice little range developed and then it develops after three o'clock, real good time to trade by the way, into a superb trend that then ran through till late afternoon and uh, you know, well 
that then settled into something which was very, very tradable and uh, brilliant, brilliant little move there. Now, that's not to say that that's going to happen uh, this Friday, but look for that sort of move. Now, I will trade before the news, several hours before that is, um, and I will trade after the news. And I will only keep a trade on if I've got a longer term trade that um, is something that is sort of well into profit, I can get a stop where I can't be hurt, uh, etc. Right now, guys, um, FX Street are probably wincing at this moment, but um, Forex Calendar is just one of the many, many sources of um, the, uh, the the calendar. FX Street, we'll look at it in just a second, is, is a really good one. And if you want to know when these announcements are going to come out, make sure you've got an economic calendar. The one at FX Street is, is superb. This one is also superb. And, um, you know, if ever you're looking at one of these and you think, well, what else do half these things mean? Because, you know, we're not all economists. And you've got to sort of understand just a little bit about this. So over here we've got a little detail section. You can just click on there and it'll open up. Tell you exactly, give you chapter and verse, just tell you exactly what it actually means or, or you know, precisely what the, the thing is. And then, of course, we, we get the previous numbers. We get a forecasted figure. And then the actual is printed up there. And, of course, there's always a delay. You know, you could never, ever rely on these uh, to, 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 to actually trade the news, to, to hit it on the button. You know, there, there are various people out there who say, yeah, 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 you know, we get in there, we trade the news, we do bracket trades and all this sort of thing. And do you know what? The number of people I speak to who, who actually try to trade on the news, I've yet to find anyone who's consistently, consistently made money trading the news as it actually comes out, as it actually comes out. You know, you get lucky now and again, and you get unlucky now and again. But there we are. Anyway, that's uh, that, that's the way that uh, I like to approach the news. So here we are. This is the um, this is the FX Street calendar, and as you can see, this is this is for today. This is for today, and we have the UK. There we are. That's eight thirty GMT, um, nine thirty sort of UK summer time. It's hold it's summer over here. A couple of good days um, over the weekend. Raining today, of course. But there we are. The numbers came out. We've got the uh, you know the previous number. The expected number, and that's where it came out. And of course, we had um, we had actually, you know, <laughs> the other question is, do these numbers get leaked before the event? Well, you know, there's a question to uh, be, be be answered. But to watch what was going on with cable for the for the sort of half three quarters of an hour prior to these numbers coming out, well, you know, you could be forgiven for thinking that maybe these numbers do creep out into not exactly the public domain. Um, or, you know, there are a lot of clever people out there who've got their um, crystal balls and uh, they polished them up quite nicely and they knew what the figures were going to be before they actually came out. So there we are. That's, um, that's FX Street. <clears throat> very, very useful. We're going to be looking at um, interest rates in general in a minute, but of course there's a, a, a useful little, useful little um, set of interest rates down here. So we can see that the UK, 0.5%, uh, Australia, 4.5%. What a difference. What a difference between the two there. And of course, um, Europe, 1%, US, quarter percent, Japan, of course, there we go, the one that's been the lowest for the longest, 0.1%. And one wonders if Japan will ever emerge from uh, its, uh, its, its torpor that it seems to be, uh, it seems to be in. So, right, now let's just um, consider the, um, the next slide in a moment. There we are. Yep, we got it. We got it. Just want to look at the carry trade for a minute because this is one of the one of the big fundamentals that uh, does drive things. Now, this is a very clear, naked, open to the world interest rate view and an interest rate play. Now, the carry trade has been going on for well, ever since um, ever ever since it was possible to borrow in a low interest rate and to uh, deposit in a high interest rate. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't need to tell you how long that's been going on. And it's been going on clearly for decades, 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 decades. So what is the game? Well, quite simply, what you do, you just look down this, this interest rate table and you find the highest yield, okay? 
you find the very, very highest yield. Now, we got the very, very highest yield uh, um, that we'll sort of uh, be able to pick up in a minute. And um, what is it? Well, <laughs> we've got a choice here of, of Brazil, which is 8.75, Egypt, which is 8.5, and, of course, Iceland over here, which uh, is 8.5 as well. Do you want to put your money in, in Iceland? Well, you might want to be a little bit wary about that one. So you've got a balanced risk. And, of course, there is a, there's a simple reason that there are high interest rates. And the simple reason is that there's risk. So the higher the interest rate, the greater the risk. Okay, the greater the return, provided that, you know, whatever is the risk factor is not going to uh, really come to play. And, um, but as we found with uh, all of those local authorities, municipalities in the states, etc., all those people who pile money into just chasing the highest interest rate, you know, you, you tend to get these finance directors, etc., who should know better, probably missed out on the economics class when they told them that uh, high interest actually is related to risk. Anyway, they know that now. They, they've learned that lesson. But... So what do we do? We find a, a high interest uh, rate. Right, you can get this off um, fxstreet.com, Boyke, and you just, uh, into the search box, type in uh, world interest rate, and this page will come up. Okay? The best source of Forex information on the internet. There we are. Quick plug for uh, FX Street. But no, it's absolutely right. Um, brilliant site. So um, we're probably not going to go for Iceland. Brazil... Okay, it's emerging really quite nicely and just maybe a real good one to use. In fact, I know people who are piling into uh, Brazilian municipal bonds and all the rest of it at the moment. And, uh, you know, that's probably a real good play, but I'm just going to leave that one out for the moment. Egypt as well, you know, not... One of the big problems with all of these is their currencies are minor currencies. Now. They're, uh, they're not easily traded. So let's just... Uh, find something then that is easily traded and is a good, 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 rock-solid economy, and that's Australia. Why is it rock-solid? Right, number one, they didn't get involved in subprime. Not not too, well, they did just a little bit, but they didn't, 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 didn't get carried away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they did not get carried away, and um, yeah, you could look at South Africa. You know, is there political risk there? Well, I know that's very close to your heart, um, and your location. But um, let's just consider uh, Australia for a moment. Rock solid, uh, exporting oodles to China, backed by, you know, it's a gold economy, etc. The economy is booming, and uh, it, it's one of the safest ones around. So let's then look at that one. 4.5%, let's gain that, but let's do a little trade against uh, that with maybe the uh, with, with, with Japanese. So if we can, if we can buy, all right, so if we can buy the Australian dollar and at the same time sell the Japanese yen, we can lock in the interest rate differential. Or indeed, we could do it with the euro. And there's a good reason for wanting to do that against the, against the euro rather than the, uh, the Japanese yen. So let's just, let's just have a look at this for a minute. Let's just, just look at the numbers here. If we go long, okay, the AUD against the euro, then what we're going to be doing, we are going to be receiving 4.5% per annum, okay, based on our contract. You know, if we're only going to put up a couple of grand for a contract, well, chances are we will not need to put up more than about a grand. But what we'll actually get is the 4.5% on the full 100,000 standard lot, okay, 4.5%. That equates to 4,500 per year. Okay. Now, at the same time, we're going short the euro. So it's long the Australian dollar against the euro. We have got to pay, all right, the other side of this, which is 1%. So what are we going to do? We're going to lock in the difference between the two. So that's 3.5% per year based on the 400,000, 3,500 per year. Now, if we only hold it for six months, let's chop it in half if we hold it for, you know, Three months, let's chop that, uh, you know, in, in by four, divide it by four, etc. So we would just need to, um, 
modify the number of days that we're holding it by the number of days in the year, etc. So, what we want to do, we want to hold this one for all the time that the Australian dollar keeps going up and the euro keeps going down. Right now, of course, we've got the euro collapsing. So, this particular trade has been, you know, is it still going to be great? Well, it has been really, really good. Of course, you know, at some point there's going to be a day of reckoning. It's all going to reverse. Well, we'll look at that in just a second. But there we are. So we've got this income of 3.5% based on the full 100,000 lesser haircut, of course, because, you know, we're not going to get that full 3.5%. In reality, of course, we will find that uh, our, our brokers, you know, depending on who we're actually doing this through, are going to, you know, they're, they're going to be taking probably around about half of it and uh, leaving the other half for us. So as long as we're long the, the Australian dollar and short the euro, we will receive the interest. If we did it the other way around, by the way, we would have to be paying the difference. So we get two lots of income. We get the carry trade income, okay, from the yield, plus, plus, we get the capital gain. Now that capital gain can be really quite useful. Now this chart that we're looking at here, um, I would have preferred this chart to have been up the other way, but my trade station won't actually let me um, show the reciprocal of this one. So, just look at this. From let, let's just take a year. Let's just take a year on this thing. This is this is sort of around about um, well, let's go back to April, March, April last year. Okay, March, April last year. What have we got? We got the euro against the Australian dollar up there around about two. Then the euro just kept on coming down, 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 endlessly down until you know, just a, a few weeks ago. While, of course, the euro is going down, the Australian dollar is going up. All right, and of course, this is reflecting that carry trade that we've just been looking at. So, not only are you going to get that uh, locked in interest rate differential, but just look at that capital gain. Look at that, you know. <laughs> Look at 1,000 pips, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 pips, etc. as the thing rolls down. But let's just be realistic about this and realize that uh, sooner or later, sooner or later, the party is going to come to an end. And that's going to come to an end at some point when, in this case, the euro is going to need to pick up strength, all right? And or the Australian dollar is going to stop rising. Now, of course, you know, things never go on in one direction forever. And as we can see on this chart, this is a weekly chart, the big, big green candle that popped up there, okay, popped up there so, so strongly. And if we look back, there is no other candle which is quite so strong. By strong, you can just literally just look at the, the depth of the candle, and uh, you know that start of the trade was uh, was had had one there. In fact, that engulfing that uh, really sort of kicked the thing off uh, a year ago. Uh, well, you know that was a fairly deep one, but this, without a doubt, is a deep one. Does this mean it's all completely over? Well, no, not necessarily, not necessarily, but certainly those gains that people have been sitting on there holding this trade, probably adding to it over this last year. Maybe, just maybe, they're deciding that, yeah, you know, let's just look at this profit that we've got and let's see if we can preserve it. So, that's uh, that's uh, that's just looking at that uh, potential trade. Now, let's just look at this other chart for um, just a bit of a reality check as well on the carry trade. Now, this is going back in time. This, this this chart is the New Zealand dollar, okay, New Zealand dollar against Japanese yen. And the New Zealand dollar kicked off this trade way back there, around about 2000, 2001. And the New Zealand economy, equally strong as the Australian, much smaller economy, of course, but it's incredibly strong. And its interest rates were gradually rising. In fact, they were sort of moving up around the 10 plus uh, percent uh, rate. At the same time, Japanese interest rates were very, very low, showed absolutely no signs of moving. So, the carry trade was absolutely brilliant, locking in a massive 
interest rate differential. You know, people were pocketing eight, nine percent out of this over. Look at this years, years, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and then just see that little peak there up around about uh, the, uh, the 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 eighty four region, the Friday four. What actually happened then? Well, it was one um, sort of January, and uh, I can't remember his name now, but the uh, Japanese finance minister at the time just made a little sort of off-the-cuff comment to the effect that, hmm, yeah, we just wonder if our interest rates have been too low for too long. <laughs> Perhaps. Blind panic. So the carry trade just, it, it just shot on down, and, uh, you know, the blind panic eventually subsided and then on effort went and then exactly the self same thing happened again just prior to the, the major major collapse and uh you know of course from there we've seen heard all sorts of comments coming out of japan suggesting that just maybe their economy is turned to the corner etc etc no real evidence of that at the moment because they've still got so many embedded problems with their debt to gdp ratio so then it just collapsed, and of course the whole thing unwound within the space of uh, the space of a couple of months. So there we are. That's the sort of thing that could happen. Now let's just have a little ponder on the uh, economic future. Now I like to consider the unthinkable from time to time. I, I, I like to do a bit of constant thing. And ContraThink takes me into the area of um, just looking at whatever the situation is currently and thinking, well, what could the opposite be? In fact, uh, years ago, I used to uh, do a consulting with com companies so on, on um, strategic management. And what we would um, what we would get um, managers to do was to just um, just consider alternative scenarios. Just forget about what the consensus view is because um, it, it's so blinkered. And so often, when you get a consensus view, actually, what is likely to happen is the opposite. So, here we are, we've got the British pound. Now, you can pick up stacks of information about economics in general. You can get it from Forex Street. You can get it from Forex Factory. You can um, subscribe to various newsletter letters. Um, amongst newsletters, I really recommend uh, John Maldin. Now, a good many of you guys, I guess, um, read John Maldin, quite a thinker, but he comes up with an awful lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, you can look at things like Market Watch, Bloomberg, Reuters, etc. You will get this information from all sorts of different sources. You can uh, have subscriptions, as I do, to things like uh, Fortune magazine. Probably the best one is Forbes um, and uh, website Forbes.com. Where you can get a lot of um, a lot of really good reasoned uh, arguments, and then you need to sort of put your own sort of uh, dimension on things. So let's just consider this: we've got the British pound against the Australian dollar. This is only over the last few months, but if this chart, if we we've got a minute, we'll look at the real charts going way back. But this thing has been in decline for about eighteen months. Okay, getting on for a couple of years. At around about the time that um, it was showing that the Australian economy was absolutely going gangbusters. So all this time that the British pound is coming down, the Australian dollar is going up. Okay, So what have the Australians got uh, going for them? They have got a gold-backed economy. And what do we find? We find that gold is on the increase. They did not get involved in subprime. So their banks and so on avoided all the CDO, CDSs and all that sort of stuff um, to any great extent. Certainly, they didn't get themselves into trouble with uh, big, big trouble with their banks having to be sort of merged, taken over, and all the rest of it bailed out by government. Third fact, they've got China. Now, China, as we know, have been building roads, power stations, factories, absolutely like crazy, Olympic Stadia, and so on. And, of course, their demand for aggregates has been immense. Aggregates, you know, stones sand, gravel, all that sort of stuff. And where do they get it from? Ah, oh, they get it from that uh, nice little mining country, which is not too far away, which is Australia. And, of course, you know, that has really buoyed up their economy. So, it's been going so, so well. Now, at the same time, what do we find? That the UK economy, the consensus is, 
that again it's shot to pieces. Okay, we had a former Labour government who were very good at uh, playing ostrich head in the sand. Oh, let's just keep borrowing. You know, oh, somebody picked up a, a, a Keynes textbook or, or a book that uh, dear old uh, Keynes wrote. And uh, Keynes, well, you know, he was a bit of an academic, made a bit of money in the markets, by the way. And um, what did he do? He, he Keynes suggested that, well, you know, you just keep borrowing money. You just print the stuff every now and again. You run out of it, print some more. And then eventually, eventually, the economy will come right. Um, he was all a bit mealy mouthed about exactly how it would come right. But anyway, uh, what we found was that the UK started to do just that. They were just spending money like water, forgot about basic economics, which really means that, you know, one and one still actually does make uh, two. And that uh, if you keep uh, spending sooner or later, sooner or later, the money has to come somewhere, and if your economy doesn't grow fast enough to um, get sort of tax income, etc., you then eventually have to go to the IMF, which happened with a former Labour government way back in the 70s. In fact, there's been almost a rerun of so many other things that happened in the 1970s, really, in the last few years. So, there we are. We've got a British pound sort of uh, shot to pieces in terms of its general economy, and we've got an Australian economy, which is superb. Then, what's happened over the last three months? March, April, a little bit of May, we actually found that the fall had stopped falling, dropped into a trading range, and this trading range started to perk up a little bit. In fact, preceding, look at that gap. How often do we see big gaps like that in the Forex market? Well, not very often. So, it gapped down, exhaustion gap maybe, technical exhaustion gap, and then it started to look as if it just might want to move on back up. Took another little blip on the downside there. Full straight, by the way. And then, what do we find? Well, look at that. 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, 1,200. Nearly, nearly, well, let, let's not to get, get too carried away. In the space of a few days, we got a thousand pips. And that was a little bounce back. So, let's now just consider the opposite of all of that economic argument that I just put. Right. Number one, China, China has got over capacity. In fact, it, so many commentators are now telling us that they've built far too many roads, more power stations than the the sort of power requirement of China over the next 20, 40, 50 years is ever going to need. Sort of, they've got you know, twice and three times the power capability, apparently, we are told. Okay, so they've been overdoing that. They've probably got not too much need for all these Olympic stadia. They've got a housing bubble that is, is going to potentially be a bubble beyond belief. We're actually now even finding that the Chinese are having to curb Lending. They're actually telling their, um, their, their sort of uh, local local branch banks and so on, do not extend any more loans. There is overcapacity like crazy. The China economy looks very much as if it has just bubbled over. Now, in the fullness of time, I'm sure that that'll all get itself for, sorted out. But what about the next three months? What about the next six months? What about the next sort of 12 to 18 months? China is now looking very much like a question mark. Okay, so is that going to follow through into the fact that the Australians might have a little bit of a problem selling more aggregate? You betcha, certainly will. Link that up to the Australian um, uh, fiscal authorities saying that, ah, right, well, what about our tax take from all of these super profits that the uh, aggregate companies have been making? So what do they do? They wallop uh, an extra tax on. Now, economies in general do not like tax increases, so. Okay, we've got another negative over there. Um, look at a chart. I've got one somewhere. I'm probably not going to pull it up. But if you just look at a chart of house prices in Australia and compare them to, say, those in the US or Europe or whatever, they've got a housing house price bubble over there. What happens to bubbles? Bubbles get pricked and they break. So just maybe this economic miracle in, uh, in Australia, it's overdone. 
it's overdone. And so now is the time that it's going to be winding back. We'll look at a chart in just a second of the Australian dollar, and we will find that the the fall in recent in this last sort of week or so has been really dramatic. The penny has finally dropped. But if you can start thinking of that way back, if you start thinking about that, say two three months ago, what could be the likely alternative scenario? Then one can start to be positioned right for this sort of move. Okay? So there we are. Now, at the same time, let's just consider the, the UK economy. What have we got? Changing government. We've got a government which it seems to be more or less committed to reducing deficits, etc. We're actually finding now that the market is a little happier about UK debt than it was, and indeed we've even found that some of the UK gilt uh, interest rates have been falling, which means the gilt's been rising, which is uh, <laughs> or the unthinkable. So just maybe the British pound is something that is not a basket case after all, and it is recoverable. It's got an economy which, apart from one or two little rumoured tax increases along the way, just might have a government which is going to release the sort of pent-up entrepreneurial um, spirit which had been more or less crushed by the Labour government. So just might, we just might now see this whole thing start to start to unwind. So there we are guys, that's just taking a look at an alternative view and um, considering what could be happening then with um, with the market and this alternative view. Right, now bear with me, don't go away, let's just switch over and take a look, if we can, at a chart or two. Right, let's just um, get our little, um, there we go. Right, now guys, you should be seeing a chart of the euro, gets the US dollar, monthly chart on a back background. Can you um, just let me know if you can see that all right? Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Boyke. Thank you. Okay, guys. Right. Well, let's just look at one or two different charts here. First of all, then, are we gazing into oblivion here for the, uh, the euro? Well, see where these various bands are. These are various uh, Fibonacci clusters and price seems to have just managed to drop down below there at the moment but of course there's a big number there 1.2 just when so many people are telling us expect parity with the US dollar that's just down there 1 to 1 uh, then is it going to get down there well it just might do that but how soon is it going to do it well along the way I guess that we're going to see some fairly major ructions going on and of course Just down here, then what have we got? We've got um, we've got 1.2 where we could still we could still have uh, a bit of a turnaround there at the moment. Um, right now, then what I wanted to do was to take a look at little look at that other chart that we were looking at, and uh, let's just bring in a little bit more data here. I don't know if this will let us pull up all the data I want. It's not quite going to do that. We'll go out to a weekly chart. But, right guys, this then is the weekly chart. This is the weekly chart that we were looking at. British pound against the Australian dollar. And we see that high up there above uh, 2.6 and uh, the thing has come down almost to all the way to 1.6. So without a doubt, we've got a massive, massive downtrend there, a massive move down. And you know, we can just sort of pop some, some lines down. And if ever there was a steep decline at uh, somewhat greater than 45 degrees, then that's it. Now, the big question here is, has this whole thing turned the corner? Are we now just looking at the start of a new trend moving on up? Well, we just don't know. It may, it may be happening. It may not be happening. And uh, we could well find that this is now going to sort of move on up or indeed it's going to settle back into this consolidation zone. 
So what I'm really putting forward is just considering the opposite of whatever the general consensus view is. And the longer that consensus view holds, the closer to the time when it's got to reverse. Because, you know, as with the Australian economy, you can only have so much superb goodness and, um, you know, you can only have so much badness, if you like, about things like the uh, the UK economy. Sooner or later, things always revert to their knee. They always do. Absolutely always do. They always overshoot, of course, in, in either direction. So, could we see that this has got the capability to get back up to this this level of uh, this level of two, perhaps? Well, just maybe, just maybe. Right, okay, guys. Now I'm just going to close with a uh, a a little comment on the. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. Good point. That good point, Porky. <laughs> right. Well, it's. Probably, I guess, you know, it's very difficult to actually put a number on it, but I guess it's around about 80-20. The, the fundamentals are 20%, technicals, you know, I will trade quite happily off technicals all day long. Not, you know, completely blinkered, know nothing about the uh, fundamentals. But when you've got a potential biggish move that this is a, well, I mean, we've had a biggish move, so there are certainly a few pips to be taken out of this over, over the last few weeks. Then um, I'm going to start to link it up with the, uh, the technical story where you've got you've got a chart, you know, it's just moving on down in one direction forever. Then I'm starting to look at, at the fundamentals, considering what uh, what just might be happening there, just what might be happening. So there we are. Now, one or two people were asking me uh, recently, uh, whereabouts do you get your information from? Well, I've mentioned things like Forbes, FX Street, of course. Um, but there again, you might want to get an up-to-the-minute um, newswire coming out. And what I really recommend is a UK-based one. And it is Ramsquark, um, www.ramsquark.com. Great number of guys, and uh, they're based in, uh, based in London, based in the city. And if you want uh, a continual, um, a continual uh, chat to you about what is actually going on, um, in terms of the FX market, they also do one, do a, do a, do a feed, which is for equities as well, and of course, um, interest rates. But, um, they've got a market on the pulse. So if you're trading intraday, really do recommend www.ramswalk.com. Okay, guys, that's it. I better sign off at this point, um, uh, before, uh, before Vicky uh, uh, cuts me off uh, here. So good to be with you again, guys, and uh, we'll see you again. Uh, I'll be with you again um, next month, where we'll have a, a, a topic which is actually to link the two together. And uh, I'm going to be introducing one or two um, fairly new, slightly different, slightly off the wall uh, technical aspects that, uh, that 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 I use in my trading. Bye for now, guys. <laughs>